The people that pay the price for a rise in the federal funds rate from the Fed are the consumers, ultimately. Well, I, I think what we're seeing and what's not necessarily being reported in the press, because you to be honest, the financial press here in the U.S. is, is behind the eight ball when it comes to you know underlying fundamentals. They, they tend to take sort of the rosy approach on everything until... Uh, you know, until something bad happens. Um, with all due respect to them, it's really up to us as an alternative, you know, sphere, alternative media, social media, to, to basically point out problems as they happen. We had some bank failures here in the U.S. in the spring. I'm sure everybody around the world knows that um, we had First Republic and Silvergate, uh, SVB, and then, of course, across the pond, Credit Suisse was having its own set of issues. So the banking system kind of was highlighted this spring. But something a lot of people don't know is we've been having bank failures here in the U.S. at a record pace. So when you look at the data, a faster amount of small and medium bank closures here in the U.S. than we've ever had. And this dates back to uh, the mortgage mess back in 2008, the tech crisis in 2000, uh, earlier, uh, earlier decades of savings alone, I believe, was in the 80s. So this is one of the fastest paces on records that the banks are having all sorts of issues uh, and I've been looking at the banks in terms of a liquidity perspective. Um, anybody that follows my channel the last couple of years, you know, we did a big series on Basel requirements and how you know the BIS is trying to, to implement standards for the banking system, make it more solvent. And it, a lot of it has to do with liquidity ratios. How much free capital or good assets do you have compared to money that you have outstanding, you know, and also taking into account things like back debt. And if you look at those liquidity ratios for the major, the large commercial banks in the U.S., it, it doesn't look too good. Uh, there are a couple more that have very high liquidity ratios, over 80%, uh, like loan-to-value ratios, where they don't have a lot of free capital. And for those, I believe, on average, for the large commercial banks, the data that I got from S&P Global Intelligence was that they're about 78.8% highly levered. And even some of the assets on their books, there seems to be some questions about whether or not those are going to end up being good assets or not. And not only that, but slightly less than 50% of all deposits fall in insured. So over 50%, I believe it's 51.1% of uh, cash deposits, I should say, at the major commercial banks in the U.S. are uninsured. So if you're banking at a major commercial bank in the United States, you've got a greater than 50% chance that your funds will not be covered in the event of a bank failure. Of course, earlier this spring, the Federal Reserve and the FDIC worked together to bail out uh, the depositors of those institutions. What was less talked about was the investors, the bondholders, and the stockholders basically got zero or close to zero in those cases. So in order to ensure the depositors, they had to allow all the investors in that company to fail. So even though a lot of the depositors were made whole in those earlier bank failures, uh, it adversely affected investors. And I don't think, Andrew, given the amount of banks right now that are in trouble and the amount of overall uninsured uh, consumer deposits in these commercial banks, that if we have another banking crisis, which looks like it's coming to the United States, if we have another banking crisis, most people are going to lose their money if they're deposited at a big bank. And, and that's a really scary situation to be in. Yeah, and I think what was interesting was, wasn't it? It wasn't bad enough that the U.S. got downgraded by Fitch for from uh, uh, from triple A to double A plus. Um, then we got the, Mo the f shortly followed by the Moody's downgrade of the uh, of ten uh, of ten banks, uh, small, medium uh, sized banks. But they also seem to indicate. Or, or the, 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 in fact, we, I was looking to an analyst on, on Bloomberg, which I tend not to, li to listen an awful lot to, but um, we're talking about, well, yeah, well, you know what? This is going to likely roll into the big banks, which is what you're talking about. And I mean, this is, when you think about it, you just outlined, and you're a forensic guy. I mean, you, you, you have an audit background, you know. So when you look, when you look at these numbers, you look at it, you know, we take notice because this is, it gives us an extra, an extra view. Um, but when you think that, and you talk about, I mean, obviously the next shoe to drop, I think, uh, the commercial real estate market is, is what seems to be the issue with 80% of, 
of all of those of, of that is held by these small regional banks. So, 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 I mean, this is Rob, this is what gets me. So you've got the Fed talking up. Yeah, we're going to go higher for longer, longer for stronger. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so as long as the stock market rises, yeah, we're going to keep raising rates and, and, but I mean, didn't that cause the problem in the first place? The speed of these rate cuts. So, what, what 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 do you think? I mean, how how imminent do you think this might be? Well, it's interesting because what we've also seen at the same time, Andrew, is there were about in the large commercial banks there were about a little over eleven trillion in, in deposits from consumers, uh, dating back to April twenty twenty two. In the last year and two or three months almost a trillion dollars has been taken out. Uh, consumers are wising up and taking their money out. Now, they may be doing it to pay bills. Uh, it, there may be you know, reasons why they have to spend that money, but it is a, it's almost a tenth of all consumer deposits of large commercial banks has been pulled out in the last year. And one of the reasons why, going back to the Fed, when the Fed raises interest rates, that forces these commercial banks into a tough position. Because on one hand, they can charge higher rates for investment products. On the other, they must then put in higher rates to their consumers in terms of deposit returns or else they're going to lose them. And what consumers are seeing is we're over 5% federal funds rate, which affects things like mortgages and auto loans you know, down the line. All that gets eventually passed down the line because when banks have a higher cost to borrow, they must pass on those costs to the consumers. Ultimately, the people that pay the price for a rise in the federal funds rate from the Fed are the consumers, ultimately. And what's happened is there's a big what we call deposit gap. The banks can charge a lot for auto loans and home loans and credit card rates and revolving rates and all those types of things. The consumers are still sitting there getting zero or a quarter percent or a half if you're lucky. And as that deposit gap widens, history has shown the consumers simply pull their money out of the banks.